Thank you. And welcome again. First, I want to say thank you to Amanda Perino and the entire team behind this incredible organization of this conference. I had no idea just how much work went into this until I saw it from the inside, and it is nuts how much preparation it takes to put on a show like this. Absolutely incredible. And the fact that Amanda also managed to time the weather together with Rails 8 releasing here is just fantastic. So thank you to Amanda and the entire team. The topic of today is Rails 8. I am going to dive into all the wonderful new features and libraries and everything we got going on. It is one of the most exciting releases of Rails that I can remember. We have to go back uh, at least until Rails 7 for me to have been this excited about a new release of Rails. And I want to spend a little time talking about Rails 7 because it sort of set a new tone, in my opinion, for where the framework is going and the confidence with which it meets the world. I think for a while we were taking cues from the rest of the world and realizing that, do you know what, the front end is moving this direction, uh, cloud is moving in this direction, we just have to follow along. And I had a growing sense of unease with that sense of following because I thought there were a lot of parts along that path that didn't make sense to me, that wasn't the right way to go, but I didn't have a proper way to articulate that yet. So for years, I had that brewing sense that we could do better. Even at the launch of, I think it was Rails 5, when we integrated Webpacker, I thought, you know what, this is something we just have to do. It's not necessarily something I'm super excited to do. Well, Rails 7 brought back that excitement. And it brought that back that excitement because it felt like there was finally an opportunity to realize a vision that had been growing for a very long time and to give us a map towards future releases of Rails that could follow that same confidence, that could develop that confidence. And one of the lenses I've been using to guide that has been the idea of the pattern language, the template of the pattern language. You have a problem, you have a context, you have a solution, and you have some consequences. And when I looked at all the things I did not like about where the web was going, it was patterns that felt stale. Patterns that had been marked for garbage collection but had not yet been picked up. Patterns that were no longer relevant in the context that we were able to push forward now. For Rails 7, the change of context for me was the underlying change in web technology. It was the introduction of ES6, JavaScript actually being good straight in the browser with no transpilation. It was the fact that HTTP2 had made it unnecessary to bundle items into to big um, units. And then finally, the fact that import maps allowed us to write modern code directly for the browser. Now, the pattern invalidation that came from this was very clear to me. We used to have a pattern that said you could open four connections um, to the browser and you had to wait one at a time to, to open more. Therefore, we must bundle everything. We had a pattern that said, you know what, the browsers really suck at JavaScript, but we have better ideas. We can trans pile those ideas into better JavaScript and turn that to the browser. All of these advances invalidated that context. Those ideas no longer made sense, but I think as software developers, there's two things we're historically bad at. One is naming things, and the other is cache, inval cache invalidation. And it's the cache, cache invalidation of mental models that I care the most about. That's where I really see the lag. This context, the ES6, HTTP2, if not import maps, had happened years in advance of us taking full advantage of them. Had happened years uh, after people thought, you know what, the way to build for the web is to have these long, cumbersome, complicated build pipelines. And then this context is rediscovered and we realized, you know what, there's a bunch of patterns that no longer make sense. For Rails 7, 
Part of the answer to that new context was Hotwire. Here is a new, simpler, modest way of writing JavaScript that goes together with your backend. Um, and it works beautifully in that new context. It is a pattern fit for 2024. It was not a pattern that was fit for 2012. It was not a pattern that was fit for a time before we had gone through the necessary jungle of complexity that allowed us to get to a simpler place. And my work on both Hotwire and figuring out which of the patterns of today were no longer relevant was, as always, driven by extraction. We are not in the business of making speculative frameworks in the Rails community. We are in the business of taking solutions that we have proven to work in real applications with real customers under real production pressures and taking those solutions out, packaging it up nicely as gifts and then sharing. That's what we do here. And my work on Hey was that path that led to the discovery of those new patterns, led to the validation that, you know what? The whole industry is wrong. It's like that meme. Is everyone wrong? Um, no, no, um, it, it must be, well, am I wrong or is everyone wrong? No, everyone must be wrong. That was essentially the premise of Rail 7's approach to, to the front. Everyone is wrong. We do not have to accept heavy build pipelines. We do not have to accept bundling. We do not have to accept tree shaking. We do not have to accept all of these premises of modern web building as facts. We can write a different story. And that's what we did with the, uh, with the creation pay. Now, what's interesting is I started working on Hay in 2018. And I saw some of these trends coming, but it wasn't ready yet. Even on the launch of Hay in 2020, it wasn't quite there yet. We had structured our things around Hotwire, but we were still using, I think, Webpack at the launch. And it took a little while, um, about, in fact, a year, before we were able to fully realize these ideas and move them forward. And in fact, it was not until yesterday that we were able to fully go 100% no build for all of Hay. There is no build line in the JavaScript. There is no build pipeline in the CSS. Everything is served directly to the browser as we wrote it. Now, the benefit for me of doing this is not just a personal satisfaction of being able to realize these patterns and new ways of thinking. It is also to provide an irrefutable anchor point for the discussion about whether this is even possible. On the internet, there is an endless cacophony of people telling you that the thing you're trying to do will not work. That that will not work in the real world, that will not work with real users, that will not work with real customers, they will just not tolerate that. The best way to refute that is not to get into an argument. It is to ship working software. And once you've shipped that working software, you have a monument to the argument that is simply immovable. You can claim that no build doesn't work for you. You can't claim that it doesn't work. We have proven that. I <laughs> think of the yearly tweet from Toby as the perfect embodiment of this phenomenon. For 20 freaking years, people have told us that Rails does not scale. In November of last year, Toby tweeted about doing one million requests a second on the largest Rails app in the world. This is a monument that says, shut the fuck up. <laughs> this argument has been settled. <laughs> We don't need to rehash this. Just see the tweet. The tweet is the monument. And then we have the tangible benefits. This is um, Hay's loading of JavaScript. That's how it looks. There are no source maps. There is no bundling. We are sh shipping everything straight to the browser as we wrote it. And you can go in and look through all of it.
Now, I look at that with just an endearing sense of nostalgia, because that's how I learned the web. I learned the web by looking at how people did it before we came up with contraptions like minification, one of the absolute atrocities inflicted on the open web. Minification takes this premise that if we could just save 2%, 5% of the overhead, it's worth destroying the web as a learning platform for new people. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We owe an enormous gratitude to the open web, and we ought to be proud to pay tribute by allowing view source. And view source requires this. You cannot do the view source if you're tree shaking, bundling, whatever. You can try to perhaps patch it on with some source mapping and whatnot. And now you're piling more complexity up on top of the complexity and the tower will fall. The other thing I realized was the initial trigger for me to even get interested in no build for Rails 7 was just an infuriating annoyance by being unable to compile a JavaScript project I had so carelessly left alone for about five minutes. <laughs> None of the tools worked. Everything was outdated. And when I went to try to update it so I could compile it again, I literally couldn't figure it out. I spent half a day wrestling with Webpacker at the time, and I did turn over the table. I'm saying, no, I, I made the integration for Webpacker to Rails, and I cannot figure out how the fuck this works. No, no. There's something deeply fundamentally broken in that model. And that's when I came to realize the truth. And the truth is, only the browser is forever. Only the browser will allow us to run code, markup, and styling that we made 30 years ago with no modification and no complaint. That is the beauty of the modern browser. It is a beast of complexity, and I would not wish it on my most mortal enemy to try to implement one from scratch today. But the benefits we all reap as web developers, from the fact that browsers have gotten this good with such a commitment to backwards compatibility is incredible. Incredible. The idea that you could design something in, let's say, 1995, and it's still how it looks today! <laughs> And it's still one of the biggest websites. This is Craigslist. I don't think they have changed an iota of that design that launched back in 1995. And it still works. Not only does it still work, it still thrives. That level of longevity when it comes to software development is something we should aspire to. And I think that aspiration goes straight through the browser. It goes through the truth of the browser being the runtime of all of this code that we have. And the more we can remove in terms of intermediaries between us and the browser, the better off we are. The more we're likely to have code that will run five minutes from now. Now, saying all that, another principle that we have straight out of the Rails doctrine is the idea that we're pushing up a big tent. I have been incredibly excited about what we were able to do with Rails 7. I write all of the code we do at 37 signals is no build. Every single application we made since Hey has been built without any form of JavaScript compilation, without any form of CSS pipelining. That's incredible. That's not for everyone. It doesn't have to be for everyone. The ideas that I'm pushing forward connects to a overarching mission of creating a one-person framework with an on-ramp that is on the freaking floor that someone can step onto with very little prior knowledge about all it takes to create modern web applications. It is in service of that mission, as well as in service of my own enjoyment as a web programmer, but it's not a dictate. One of the things that have allowed Rails to thrive from Hello World to IPO is a flexibility of allowing folks to opt into the parts. Actually, that's not true. You opt into all of it. 
you get to opt out of the parts that you'd rather do a different way. And that's wonderful. There are tons of applications built with everything from React to what have you, and that's great. And I love the path that we were able to do with, with Rails 7 to, to address that. But fundamentally, what I'm excited about, why I am still here, why after 20 years I can get as fired up as I did on the first day, is that we're pushing forward towards a clear, bigger mission. That bigger mission of the one-person framework, that bigger mission of invalidating patterns which is where the context is no longer relevant. That's what gets me fired up. And I, um, I tweeted this next thing out uh, a while back, and I thought, in honor of the fact that we have mats here at Rails World, I rewrote it as a haiku. <laughs> Progress is our path. Complexity builds the bridge. Simplicity waits. <laughs> What I like about this sentiment, whether in haiku form or not, is the idea that complexity is actually a necessary ingredient to progress. But it's not where we stop. We're not done by the time we've solved it. We're done by the time we've made it simple. That's a very different philosophy on when to stop and when to get excited, and one I try to embrace in everything going forward, including Rails 8. Here is the dividend. This is what we've essentially boiled down the Rails 7 ethos to. Rely on the browser. Give me a modern browser and I can share in this bounty of goodness. All the progress that has happened, especially in the last three to four years, has made it so much better, so much more fun to be a web developer without extraneous tools. And we're able to encapsulate all of that by saying, this application is just for modern browsers. Now, we can't do that for all applications. Some applications have to support a longer tail of browsers, but we can do it for a lot. And if you're starting a new application today, you should absolutely do this. OK. There's an even bigger purpose here. The purpose is not just to find the best patterns. The purpose is not just to seek simplicity for its own sake, although that is a gift in its own right. The purpose is to optimize for our limited monkey brains. They simply can't fit that much. And if we're going to spend all of it learning the intricacies of some complicated build pipeline, there's no room for that much else. And what I want to make room for is all of it. I want to make room for the full stack developer who can see an entire problem and an entire solution and keep it in their head for as long as damn possible. Eventually, that will not be possible. I doubt that anyone actually can keep the 5 million lines of code that Shopify has in their main monolith in their head at the same time. But the fact that Toby was able to keep so much of it in his head for so long is what enabled us to get there. And that's the roundabout way sometimes that we end up in these discussions. People talk about, well, it is great for the beginning, but what are you going to do when you make billions of dollars in a day? What do you mean what you're going to do? You're going to do whatever the fuck it takes because it doesn't matter. <laughs> you have all the money in the world by then. That's not the problem to optimize for. The problem to optimize for is how do we get to the billions? That's the path. It's not like, ooh, I'm going to be slightly inconveni inconvenienced once I have it. No, no, no. And to me, the best way of looking at that problem is to look at the brain budget. That we have to compress all of these parts of the modern web development experience into small units that can fit next to each other so that so we can fit all of them. Um, I got a good lesson in this recently because I, I picked up BIM again. And you know what? BIM is one of those funny things that actually end up taking a lot of your brain space, and you have to find a way to compress that so that you can fit, well, anything else, um, including the name of, of Jason here. I mean, I think actually Jason would be 
slightly offended if I started calling him Jarvis, my business partner at 37 Seagulls. But this idea that we have limited space, we have to utilize that space as well as possible, and we do that by compressing the things that are in there, so that we do not have to subdivide this industry into tiny slices of expertise. At a certain scale, that's what you do. That's a billion dollar problem. It's not a zero to one problem. A zero to one problem is how can I understand it all? And that's our mission. It's literally the fucking headline of the website. Compress the complexity of modern web apps. But even more importantly, allowing us to go from hello world, getting started, the first thing, all the way to IPO. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. The two part. Not the hello world, not the IPO, the space in between. I think with Rails 7, we have an incredible framework for creating Hello World. It is amazing. What we're missing is the bridge to the IPO. And the first step on that bridge is deployment. It's going to production. It's taking an application that's running on your machine and putting it on the World Wide Web so that you can share it with everyone. Now, what's happened over the past, let's say, 10 years, in my experience, is that we've sort of all turned into pink elephants. Pink elephants tied with a tiny rope of learned helplessness when it comes to deployment. The entire industry has cultivated a fear of touching a server, a fear of being responsible for a computer, now, when I have my Dr. Evil hat on, I go, that's amazing. You pulled that off? You convinced programmers that computers were so fucking hard that they shouldn't touch them themselves? Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> that is a feat of modern marketing that um, I just must bow in front. But also, it's pathetic. We're the fucking elephant. Did you see how tiny that rope is? Do you know how much mass an elephant has? Do you know how little it needs to move its foot to get rid of that? Not very much at all. Now, the problem in part is... <laughs> I love how far this discourse has moved. I don't even have to make the joke. <laughs> The problem, and actually, I'm going to make the reverse. I'm not going to make fun of them yet. Um, AWS is amazing. And it's amazing in sort of the, we humans are capable of this. We humans are capable of putting an entire army of server monkeys behind an API, and they can run real fast, and they can rack stuff in, and all you see is a 200 OK. That's pretty cool. It's very cool that Amazon actually was able to solve a very real problem for themselves that they had extreme spike in utilization at certain days around the year. And then they had a lot of other days where they didn't need all those computers. That's a good solution to a good context. I absolutely endorse that vision. The problem is most of us don't live in that context. Most applications, most of the time, do not have a problem that requires constant racking of server monkeys behind an API. And the price we pay for the insurance policy in case we did is exceptionally high, not just monetarily, but complexity-wise. And furthermore to that problem, AWS is a business. I think business is great. But I also think that business have incentives, and the incentive for AWS is for you to stay a pink elephant forever. Forever to be petrified of the server, forever to be petrified of running your own shit. No. We're not going to let the Joker win. We're not going to let the Joker win. We're not going to let them convince us the servers are so difficult that AWS should have 40% margins. No. No. Dell 
someone who actually makes the fucking computers, have a 5% margin. AWS has a 40% margin. That is a failed market. That is an uncompetitive market where super profits are not being challenged by competitive pressures. We're going to do something about that. But before we do, another shout out. Heroku is to me one of the greatest breakthroughs in developer ergonomics that I have seen in my 20 year career. The fact that it came out in 2007, before most of us even had a broad conception of what containers were or how to utilize machines in this way is truly mind blowing. And the fact that they were able to sit on that advantage for over a decade before it seemed like anyone else woke up to the idea that you could reduce deployment to git push is just incredible. Heroku deserves endless accolades for what they've achieved. For the number of Rails developers they've helped go from the hello world to the look ma, it's online. That is an incredible achievement. And it was also 17 years ago. It was 17 years ago, which is mind-blowing in its own mind that it's only now we're starting to think that, you know what, maybe we should catch up. And the problem with that is in part that in those 17 years, the context has changed. Here's our Heroku Performance M Dyno. You can buy the luxurious one core, two threads, uh, 2.5 gigabytes of RAM for the small fee of $250 a month. Um, I'm sure that sounded pretty freaking good in 2012. That was a good deal, I'm sure. 2024, that's preposterous. That is ridiculous. That is offensive. Here's a hobby box I signed up for a couple of weeks ago from Hetzner, where you buy the raw hardware and you get uh, 48 cores, 96 threads, 256 gigabytes of RAM for $220 a month. What is the difference between those two things? Software. Heroku has nice software. I make software. I think I could make some nice software. I think I would rather make some nice software than pay a hundred times more for my RAM or 50 times more for my compute if they also throw in two terabytes of NVMe RAID storage. That's a pretty good deal. That's the joker. The joker is if we can convince people that they are basically incapable of touching a computer, we can charge them 100x. Because what are they going to do? Touch Linux? <laughs> um, and that business model has permeated much of developer tech. And I don't like it. This is not, this is not my meme. <laughs> but no wonder there is a growing industry of people who realize, holy shit, 100x? And I don't even have to buy the computers, I just rent them from Amazon and then I rent them to you for 100 times what I paid? What a business model. What a business model. Do you know what? That's what the VCs are saying too. <laughs> this is a growth opportunity. The insecurity of developers is a mass market. Let's tap into that. And that throttle has been pushed all the way to the floor, and I don't like it. I like when business identifies something new. I like when investment flows into that idea. I like the development of new concepts. But at some point, I'm not going to pay the premium for that forever. Now, I hate, with a mortal passion, software patents. I think they're absolutely stupid and corrosive. I hold that idea in my head next to the idea of liking medical patents. I actually think it's reasonable that the kind of drugs that we bring to market should be tested 
amongst multiple trials, and that is expensive, and that's about a billion dollars, and that requires someone being able to recoup that billion dollars for us to get wonder drugs like Usempic, which now represents, I think it is something like 20% of the Danish economy. So thank you very much for all the uh, perhaps slightly plus-sized Americans who are funding the Danish welfare state. <laughs> that is something I'm very grateful for. Um, but I also think that should have an expiration date. In the medical world, that expiration date is 20 years. In 20 years, your patent will be up and generics. I look at that and go, that's actually not a bad model. I like that Heroku was able to commercialize that initial incursion into developer ergonomics for deployment. That's great. But you know what? We're well overdue generics. We're well overdue that that drug, that cure for deployment, doesn't cost $250 for a pathetic amount of compute. We're well overdue that it should be 100 times cheaper, and we can make it through generics. We can make it through open source. Because you know what? I think we're going to save the industry from itself. Because at some point, if an opportunity is egregious enough, and it's just waiting for someone to step in and take advantage of it, this guy's going to show up. And you're not going to like him. And you know what? He only dared to 50x the price of Dara Prim, not 100x. So maybe keep that in context. Um, I don't know why he's here. <laughs> Here's the mission. Here's what's possible. No pass. No build, no pass. No build, no pass. No platform as a service required. Rails will be a framework, not just now, but going forward, that does not require you to pay a commercial vendor to go to production in a way that feels reasonable and approachable. That's the mission for Rails 8, to get us to this place where the passes of the world, they're there as optional extras for minority use cases. The main path is for you to deploy your own application to any hardware of your choice in any configuration, whether cloud, VM, your own computer, or a Pi in the closet. That's what we're going to do. But first, we have to go back to this problem that the cloud so cleverly infected us with. Server phobia, this idea that servers, uh, they're icky. I don't want to touch them. Can someone relieve me of that responsibility? No, no, don't buy that premise. Don't buy that premise. Because there is a cure. There is a cure to server phobia. You can get over it. It's called Linux. It's called Linux. Not only is Linux the thing that actually runs all of our servers, it also runs on your computer if you would like to give it a try. And I think you should. Whether you want to run it full-time or don't want to run it full-time, it doesn't matter. This is cognitive behavioral therapy. One little exposure at the time. I have a framework 13 that's running right up here. You can come touch it afterwards. <laughs> it will not bite you, even though it runs Linux. And in fact, I think you should, even just as the exercise of trying something else. And to that purpose, I built for myself my favorite Linux environment, and I'm sharing it with you. Amakub is a project for taking that scary Linux machine and turning it into a comfortable, productive, great-looking Linux setup that you can jump right into and use. And you might find new things, like I did on this great discovery of Linux I had this year. One of the things might be a new editor. You might actually finally think that Vim is just right for you. You might appreciate a new computer. I was not in the market for a computer that did not have a little apple on the front of it for literally 20 years. And then I came out of that haze and realized, oh, other people are making cool stuff too? <laughs> Who would have known? And for me, Framework is a great example of that. And Framework is actually here. I am running it on my machine. It works beautifully with Amakub. Um, so this is just an invitation. Now, I know what you think. <laughs> What about the hacker? He's going to get me. That's the pink elephant talking. You don't have to listen to the pink elephant. 
you can graduate from pink elephanthood into something else. And that something else is also not a fucking dog. It's not this dog. This is not the dog you're going to be. No, no. This is you on day one. This was me on day one of Linux. Fuck, this was me on day 21 of Linux. But it did not last forever because eventually you'll get it. Eventually you'll level up. And that's what we aspire to. And especially when it comes to security. This is one of the things I get so frustrated about. Like, hey, here's a cheat sheet for setting up a secure server. Uh, put an SSH key on it. Make it such that the SSH key is the only way you can authenticate access to that server. And start the very nicely uh, UI for the firewall. You're done. I mean, not quite. But that's like 90% of it. 90% of the security of a Linux box is just like fucking lock it. Like, don't leave the door open. <laughs> if the door is locked, they can go up and jiggle the handle, but they won't get in. And all of this is just an incarnation of the fact it's more fun to be competent. It's more fun to know what the fuck is going on. It's more fun to know Linux because that's where your applications live. It's more fun to be competent. All right, I know you might be feeling like Woody right now, <laughs> but we're going to go to infinity and beyond. And that's actually the reason I really love eight. That's my favorite number. Because if you tilt it over, it's infinity. This is a tipped over eight. So let's go into Rails 8 and talk about some of these wonderful features that serve the mission. And the first feature of Rails 8, I'm really happy <laughs> to find it. Wait, wait, wait. You don't know what's coming. You don't know it. Is the kind of um, medicine you don't want to take, but it's good for you. Rails 8 is not going to ship with device. It's not going to ship with a black box of security. It's going to put you on the path to learning what the fuck is going on. And the way it's going to do that is we implement authentication through generation. We're going to generate the code so that you actually have to look at it, you actually have to understand it, and you actually have to realize that authenticating a user is not worth being a pink elephant for. Let alone paying someone else to do it, you should understand the basics of secure passwords. It's not that difficult. And you can learn it. Literally, this is all the files we generate when you do it, and you get a 90% authentication system. And you can jump into those files, and they're beautiful. And do you know why? Because I carefully, lovingly handcrafted them for you. <laughs> These are artisan templates that I carved out with great care to every character, it's just that you have a great starting point to work with. This is essentially also an extraction. I took this authentication system out of our own applications. This is how we write our authentication systems without sort of all the extraneous stuff. And you can learn it. You can level up. That's what we do here. We level you up. On day one, you're the dog. You don't know shit. Great. I'm glad you're here. You're not going to stay that dog forever. We're not going to let you stay that dog forever. We're going to teach you stuff and you're going to know more after you've done Rails for a while. So that's authentication. Another thing, which actually has nothing really to do with the overall topic, but I'm just so proud of it, is PropShaft. PropShaft is one of those side dividends of simplification. When we in Rails 7 went to embrace the modern stack of HTTP2 and no bundling and no transpiling, we realized that the ACID pipeline, as it previously existed since 2009, that's before JavaScript bundlers really even took off, was outdated and overly complicated. And PropShaft is one of those beautiful moments of a clean sheet of paper, which is also going to be a thread that goes through the rest of the presentation here. A clean sheet of paper where we just solve for the context we have today without carrying over any of the old baggage. And it's also beautiful. And I also know this because I also wrote it. And it's really nice. And you're not supposed to read every line of code here. But you can. 
do bundle open prop shaft after you start a new project and look at the code, I guarantee you will understand it. I also guarantee that if you do the same thing on sprockets, you don't know what way anything went, because I don't. And that's why we wrote sprockets, or sorry, prop shaft. Um, so PropShaft goes from the core idea that what's left after we have reaped all the benefits of modern browsers allowing us to ship code directly to the user is we need a load path and we need to digest assets for the far future. That's it. That's what we do. That's all we do. There's nothing else in the box. And the box can therefore be very small, easy to understand, and very few issues. More to the point, though, of the broader overarching vision is the idea that the modern web application used to require a plethora of data storages. We needed to have something to run our queues on. We needed to have something to store our caches on. We needed to have something um, to route our WebSocket updates on. And we don't anymore because we can collapse all of that into one database or one database system, at least. The database today is so fast that we do not need RAM for most operations, and we should take full advantage of that. And in Rails 8, we have. In Rails 8, we're introducing a trifecta of database-backed adapters called Solid. We have Solid Cable for backing WebSocket communication through databases. We have Solid Cache for storing caching in the database, and we have Solid Queue for running jobs on that. And it all runs from the one ring, one database system, one thing to learn, one thing to operate. And even better than that, and it was not even in the design, but it propped up along the way, SQLite has allowed us to even take the system out of database systems. There's no longer a process to operate, just a collection of files that you use directly. And that is an incredible service to our mission of making it easier to go from Hello World to something that's online. You don't even have to know how to set up a database. It is just a file on your file system. So that ends up looking a little bit like this. When you start a new Rails 8 application, you will actually get four database files for SQLite. One for the primary database where all your domain models live, one for caching, one for queuing, one for cable. And you don't even have to open this file to go live. You don't even have to know anything about how this is all configured because through the wonders of SQLite, we don't have to. The first, as I mentioned, is Solid Cable. Solid Cable is one of those extractions that came in about two weeks ago when I was preparing this talk and I was going through my demo and I saw that I still needed fucking Redis. And I was like, we're so close. We're so close to taking Redis and putting it over in the optional bucket but we're not quite there yet. We need something for Action Cable. What do we do? And then, thankfully, Nick Pesa implemented Solid Cable as a database-backed adapter for Action Cable and made my keynote so much easier. So thank you, Nick, for improving the flow of my keynote. <laughs> now, what blew my mind about Solid Cable is just how fast SQLite is, especially on the same computer. How competitive it is with a system that operates entirely in RAM like Redis. This solid cable adapter gets within 50% of the performance of a purely RAM Redis pops up shuffler around, and it's writing to a freaking file. That's incredible. That's one of those aha moments where like, yet yeah, this would not have been possible in 2009. NVMe drives have jump two orders of magnitude, that's what's allowing this to be possible. That's incredible. Now, again, whether you actually use this in production or not might depend on whether you need Redis anyway. For other things, it doesn't matter. We're trying to get the on-ramp all the way down to a point where people don't even know, don't have to know on day one where they're sitting with their little dog, pause, going on the keyboard, not knowing everything. Great. That's what we're going to get to. The second in the solid trifecta is solid cash. Now, this is something that was actually born out of direct need and extraction from our setup at Basecamp. We had a caching system built in Redis. It was rather large. I, at one point in 2015, posted a sort of uh, narcotics bust 
type picture of all the RAM we were going to put in these boxes. I think I had 15 or a terabyte or something laid out on the table. Um, that's, RAM is still expensive. RAM is still limited. Disk is sort of almost kind of not. This is where we are today with Basecamp's use of solid cache in production. We store 10 terabytes of caching for 60 days. A partial where the underlying template does not change will last in our cache for 60 days. That's a long time. It used to be 17 hours. And you'll see exactly what happens to our response time when caches get to live that long. We have a 96% hit ratio in that cache. Here is a picture of the impact. Can you tell where we introduced solid cache? Right here. 400 millisecond request on the P95 200-ish afterwards. That's the direct consequence of carrying your caches forward much longer. But we had other constraints, and this is what I love about working in the real world. This is about what I love about working in production. It's not just about gaming some benchmark. One of the problems we had when we introduced Hey was this question. My wife actually posed me when I encouraged her to sign up for the beta version of Hey. Uh, can your employees read my email? And I was like, well, I mean, <laughs> I mean. Yes, kind of. Solid Cache supports encryption. It is built on top of Active Record. Active Record encryption was also designed for Hey, and here's a second order dividend where our caches can support that too and help us fulfill our security promise on Hey. And it allows us to operate Hey exactly in a way that's a little better than ops. Ah, on whether programmers can see sensitive personal data when they are doing their normal operations of keeping systems alive. It is a big leap forward for privacy, and I hope it's something more people adopt. Um, retention is related to this. If you sign up for Hey, you use it for a while, and you delete your account, what happens? Well, not what happens at Hey, I'm going to tell you that. What happens at most companies when you delete your account? A little Boolean is set that says deleted. It's not fucking deleted. It's still in there. They can still get at it. I don't like that. When I say delete, I want to know that at some point, at least, it is gone. We back that warranty, if you will, in Hay with a specific 60 days. If you delete your stuff in 60 days, it'll be out of our logs. It'll be out of our everything, out of our database, out of our cache. So we need to back that up with a feature. This is how that looks. We have a big disk, a big cache, 10 terabytes, but we're only going to allow anything to live for a maximum of 60 days because that's our retention policy. What I also like about solid cache, being built on the rigor of active record, is that you have the power of active record underneath it. You can shard. You can take this far beyond 10 terabytes of storage if you need to, it is not constrained by a single machine. And here, the crown jewel of the solid trifecta. About 18 months ago, I looked at this when we were starting a new application, and I thought, no, I don't, I, no, I don't want that. I do not want one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fucking gems added just so I can process jobs in a new application. And what, one, two, four of them are private forks? What's going on? This is broken. No, we are going to take a clean sheet of paper and we're going to write down what we're going to do. We're going to build a new active job backend that's going to be high performance so it can live up to all the jobs that we push through the system. It's going to work on all the three major DPs such that they can work for everyone, whether they run SQLite, Postgres, or MySQL. And we're going to make it full features so that we're not going to be wanting for another six gems after we install it. And that's exactly what we built, what Rosa built. It can run in two ways. It can either run in its default, I don't even really necessarily know where the queue is way, where you run a single process and solid queue attaches to Puma. That is the default setup. Or you can run it um, 
as a separate set of job hosts, which is what most applications will do once they get to a modicum of scale. You run bin jobs to start the supervisor, and all these jobs run for you. Backed by a database, backed in a way where you can actually interrogate if something goes wrong. It's a super duper awesome system, and I am ever so pleased that we ended up coming up with all these dials that you needed to expose to tune things in high velocity environments. You can start it with all sorts of different configuration files for specific parts of your application. It even has recurring jobs built in, which was one of those challenges we faced when we were moving applications to the cloud, or into containers, I should say, and trying to figure out what to do with cron. This is a better cron that runs fully inside your Rails application and can start any job. This is actually what our definition in production looks like, at least two-thirds of it, um, of all the different cron jobs that we set up. And this entire system is doing 20 million jobs per day just on hay. It's incredible. We have another 80 million jobs to run on Basecamp and some of our other systems. We're going to bring it all onto Solid Queue to run about 100 million jobs a day. It works. It's good. It's easier. It does not require seven gems, and you can kick Redis out of your stack when you shift. Thruster. The other idea of getting rid of all the dependencies with Rails 8 is the idea of getting rid of Nginx, other forms of proxies, other forms of things you have to put in front of your application before it's ready to face the internet. The mission for Rails 8 was the Rails 8 container image that comes out of the default setup should be directly exposable to the internet. It should be fast, it should be secure, it should be easy to use, and it should require no expertise. Thruster brings half of this as one part of the proxy. It brings xsend file acceleration. If you're sending a large file, you're not going to tie up your Puma process to do so. It does cache control caching of anything you said public to or otherwise, is that, again, Puma doesn't have to deal with it. And it does gzip compression and eventually will do Brotney as well. It is installed by default in our lovely default Docker image. Down here on the Expose 80, or just below the Expose 80, you run Thrust right in front of your Puma, and you just get all this stuff. Thrust is entirely no config by default. It is just one command. You run in front of Puma, and you get all the good stuff. It's pretty damn nice. It's also written in Go. Go is a very nice language for writing proxies. And Proudly something that we employ in the Rails stack by default. Here's a part of the Rails stack. It's written in Go because Go is better at that part. Let's do that. It's also really fast. In Kevin's testing on his personal laptop, he was pulling 60,000 requests per second. Now, I know, I know you could run all of Shopify on your laptop in the corner if you just wrote it in Rust. I know that's possible, or at least that's what people on the fucking internet tells me. But this is not going to be your bottleneck. That's all that matters. This is not going to be your bottleneck. We have Kamal 2. This is how you're going to get your application into the cloud, or into your own hardware, or into any container, or into anywhere you want to put it, because we're not going to tie ourselves up on a pass. It was the missing element from us to go from declaration, we're leaving the cloud. And that was step one. And then I had step two, question mark, question mark, question mark. How are we going to do that to profit? And the missing bit was introducing Kamal. Kamal 2 levels this up substantially. It does auto SSL, so you don't even have to know anything about how to provision an SSL certificate. It does it automatically through Let's Encrypt. It allows multiple applications to run on a single server, so we scale down as well as scaling up. It comes with a really simple declaration setup for, whoop, for detailing what your deployment looks like. This is basically it. The entire setup is encapsulated in the fewest possible pieces of information we could get from you to get as close as possible to no config. It is backed by a brand new proxy that is also written in Go that we replace traffic with, the former proxy of Kamal, to 
make it even easier, make it even faster to support auto SSL, to support multiple apps with zero configuration. That was the mission for all of Kamal. How can you have no configuration at all to set up this stuff? So you don't even have to understand the concepts required. You want to see? All right, I'm going to show you a quick demo. Pay attention, it's only five minutes and goes real fast. But the precepts is I have two domains set up that both point to a single server. The application is going to live on Alpha and they're going to live on Bravo. I have a Docker hub place to store my images. That's my container. We're working very hard, by the way, to get rid of this step two. You shouldn't have to use Docker hub or any other registry service to run this. But let me show you. If they're awake back there, let me show you. All right, let's go. We're starting a new Rails application. We're going to start it off main in about a little bit. You'll be able to just start it with Rails new. We are going to generate a scaffold application like we always would, just messages with title and body. We're going to migrate that. It's all set up already. And now let's go have a look at our routes. Let's connect it straight up to the root so that you can access your application on the root when we go straight to deployment. Let's test that it works in development. Yeah, it does. Great. That's the old scaffold. You've seen that for literally 20 years. This is how little it takes to get there. Now we're ready to go to production. And we do that by opening up the deploy YAML file. We are going to fill in two things. We're going to fill in the name of the user we're going to use on the registry. And um, that's what we're going to fill in. That's DHH. And then we're going to fill in the IP address or the DNS of the server we're deploying to. Then we're going to fill in the host name we're going to bind our SSL certificate to. And I think we're almost ready to go. Well, let's, uh, let's make it multi-concurrency here. We're going to turn on that we have two processes. And we're going to turn on log level debug so we can see everything as soon as we go to production. And I'm actually going to just take out a little bit more noise from the log. I found a better way to do this sooner. but this was in the demo. Let's go to production. What does it take to go to production? First, you have to commit everything to Git so that Kamal knows which version you're deploying. Once you have that, we're going to run Kamal Setup. And Kamal Setup is going to build the Docker container image off the default Docker file. It's going to stick thruster in front. It's going to run a Docker entry point that's automatically going to set up your databases. It's going to push that to the registry. And while that is cooking, let's start another application. Let's start Bravo. And we're going to run the same thing, but we're going to use a Rails template to essentially do what I just did, just automate it. We're going to run our scaffold. We're going to run our migration, and we're going to set everything up in, uh, in the same way. Um, this is actually a really nice feature. If you make a lot of similar Rails applications, you can use the Rails template setup to do that. Bravo is set up. Let's see if we just go straight to dev. We go to straight to Oh, I ran Bravo, by the way, with Tailwind. We can add Tailwind on top. You can get a really nice looking, uh, much prettier version of our trusted scaffold when you do that. It also works with a build step if that's what you want to do. And now let's check if we are live. Is Alpha live? Alpha is live in production on a real domain name on my hobby Hetzner server I introduced you to earlier. That's all it took. There was no pre-cooking on the server. There was no setup. There was no installation. All you needed was a fresh, plain Ubuntu box to get to that step. Now, let's set up the second server on Bravo. We're going to run through the same step. We're going to build everything up. Um, but while that's cooking, let's have a look at the logs for alpha. You can run all these commands as though you were on that server. And we can see, for example, what happens here if we update a message. It is updating everything in the database. You can just scroll back as though it was local. This is really nice when you're first going to production, when you're first trying to figure out if everything is working, seeing that, that everything is, uh, is set up. We can run a console. Kamal2 has aliases, so you just write command console, you are in the production console on the server right away, and you can update all your models. Let's update that, for example, changing the title of this message and checking, voila, we updated straight from Toronto. Woohoo! Um, all right, let's go back to, uh, to Bravo here. Let's see if Bravo is in production too. Oh, oh it is. Oh, it is. Look, look. Bravo.exitsoftware.io, it is in production. Both of these applications are running with automated SSL setups on the same server. And it even runs with cable. 
It even runs with live updates. It even runs with the caching. It even runs with the queuing. Everything is pre-configured. It's running on SQLite in production with all the real stuff. All the real stuff you'd actually use for a real application. It's kind of incredible. Now we can go back here and see you got um, the supervisor entering something in the log. So you see that's alive. Let's do an update and go back here and see we have uh, an insert into the solid queue jobs. It actually ran the real job. The job queue is set up. It actually does run. Um, and it does the action cable update over action cable that again flows through um, solid cable. And then we can remove it all. That's it. Kamal, remove Y. Now we're cleaning the box again from our entire application. And if you just remove one, you're going to get a bad gateway with this beautiful 502 from the built-in proxy. And uh, that's it. <laughs> now, if you watched... Uh, the original Rails video. We spent 15 minutes making one application and did not go into production. That was 2005. Now we spent five minutes taking two applications all the way to production, and one of them even looked rather nice with Tailwind. That is a compression factor of six. We have compressed complexity by an order of six times over what we used to have to get to production. Yet somehow it still actually looks familiar. This is almost the original um, scaffold that we have. So that is Rails 8. We have authentication. We have a new asset pipeline. We have a solid trifecta. We have a thruster. We have Kamal 2. And it's giving us no build. It's giving no pass. It's incredible. And it's going to be available today in its first beta shipping um, momentarily. Raphael, right? Yes? Great. Right now. <laughs> Not only is Rails 8 going live, Kamal 2 is shipping today in final form momentarily. Solid Q is shipping in its final 1.0 today momentarily. All these things are actually ready to use. For once, I didn't have to come here to talk about vaporware. We are live. All of it is out there. I hope you start your first Rails application today. Now, I'm already three minutes overdue, but I wanted to give you a little taste. Do you want a little taste? <laughs> All right. There are a bunch of things I would have liked to have in Rails 8. We already jam-packed it full of goodies. But I would also have liked to have Action Notifier. Action Notifier is a new framework we've been cooking to do web push notifications so that we can get away from needing native applications. It's going to be great. We already run it. You already use it. If you have been on Campfire, the company, or not company, the conference chat, you are getting push notification if you sign up for them through the early version of Action Notifier that lives inside of Campfire. Um, it's a pretty simple framework, but there's some subtleties you need to deal with to set up the web, uh, web service workers, is what they're called, the service workers, connecting that to a subscription, sending it all out, making it reliable. We're going to wrap it all up. The code is all there. It's incredible. Active Record Search is a new project we started on the same premise from the same idea that what gives us bad vibes when we go to production? Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is a wonderful piece of end user functionality and a tortures methods for developers and operators. We're going to solve that because most people do not need all the firepower of Elasticsearch. They just need to search their active records. We can solve that problem in an iota of the complexity. Active record search is going to be exactly that. It's going to look something like this. You're going to declare which variables or which attributes are searchable, how they're searchable. Um, you're going to search it like this, post search announcement. Wouldn't that be nice if that was all you had to set up? Wouldn't that be nice if it was just out of the box available right away? Yes, it would. It would be very nice at all. These are the three main uh, methods we're using it. We are, again, like all the other solids, well, 
I say all the other solves. This was called solid search until I realized, you know what, that doesn't make any sense. Active record is already a database. It's not an adapter for another database. So now it's active record search, but it's built on top of it. It's doing just these things. And finally, uh, we have action text, which is something we've used in all our applications. But in our latest applications, we are using action text with Markdown. Markdown is a wonderful format for formatting text. A lot of people would prefer that over WYSIWYG Editor. We're going to build that straight into action text, and it's going to be called House MD. Um, <laughs> House is already powering WriteBook, a once application that is actually free. You can download that. You can see how it works. You can see <laughs> House, all the sources in there. That's a small taste of Rails 8.1. We have so much good stuff in store. Kamal 2.1, plenty of things coming. But I'm just going to digest it all for a moment and enjoy my red circle. That's it. Thank you.